All righty. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Marshall W. Allen Planetarium. My name is Brayden. My name is Lynn. And uh, we are going to be your astronomers that you can ask questions to this lovely evening. So welcome to our Wednesday show. This is our monthly Ask an Astronomer. So for that, we will answer any questions that you guys have. Uh, we do also have our couple of topics ourselves that we have prepared. So it'll be a really, really fun show. Um, before we do get started, if you ever have to leave at any point during the show, please exit through the entrance that you guys came in on the right. We have glow in the dark tape around the planetarium that you guys can use to find your way out. And bathrooms are located in that front front atrium and on either side of that giant telescope as you walked in. But yeah, let's get in. First question, what is that in the middle? Is that what you're asking? That is our star ball. That star ball is original to the planetarium here from 1967. Uh, it's what we use to show uh, stars, constellations, and all of that. It's really cool. We get we use that on our Friday and Saturday shows. Does anyone have any questions to start off? If not, we can get right into it. No? All right. Well, then I am going to talk about first one of my favorite things in all of the universe, and that is going to be Jupiter's moon Europa. So Jessica, if you could pull up Europa real quick. Um, as we fly to Europa, I will say Europa is an icy moon. Uh, it is one of Jupiter's Galilean moons. Um, we will slowly fly there. But um, it is an icy moon that gets astronomers very, very excited. Uh, we currently have a mission sent to uh, go um, observe it. And that is going to be the Europa Clipper, which I will talk about in just a bit. But first, we're going to head out to Europa. Now, let us really uh, set in in our little voyage through space right now. It is weird. I usually never see it from an upside down angle. So, it's a fun look at the night sky. It is. There's Jupiter, and there is Europa. So as you can kind of see, Europa is encrusted in a very, very thick sheet of ice. As we're kind of looking, do you guys see how there's some lines along Europa? What do you think that is? Any guesses? Yeah, you're right there. Cracks? Absolutely. Those are cracks in the ice. Specifically cracks because of two things. One, you can see one of the reasons right over there. And then the other reason is, if Jessica, you could turn on all of the other orbits real quick. The 94 other moons orbiting around Jupiter. So Jupiter is caught in a constant tug of war between, uh, not Jupiter, I mean Europa. Europa is caught in a constant tug of war between uh, Jupiter and all of its other moons. And that tug of war heats up the inside of the icy moon. And on the inside of the icy moon, that heat, uh, we can kind of see what that leads to if you will Slice Europa in half, Jessica. Thank you. So Europa has a very, very deep ocean of water. Um, this ocean is theorized to be about 60 miles deep. To put that in terms that makes sense, uh, here on Earth, oceans get up to about two and a half miles deep. Um, so about 30 times deeper right here on Europa. Yes. That's exactly what I'm going to get into. Um, we believe, a lot of astronomers believe it does. We don't have any proof yet, but we, but currently Europa is the number one uh, uh, place in our solar system that has life other than our own. It's our best guess. Uh, because at the bottom of this ocean, there are hydrothermal vents that uh, we believe would be the perfect breeding ground for life. So. On Europa, we have about a two-mile uh, thick sheet of ice and then a 60-mile deep ocean that hopefully houses alien fish. And Euro we are currently sending a mission to Europa called the Europa Clipper, which is scheduled to take off in October of this year. And um, with that, we will orbit around Europa here and take samples from the crust to maybe see if there are any remnants of life. And uh, some actually really exciting news about the Clipper just happened. 
uh, the main thing with that being that it just finished getting all of its uh, instruments installed. So now it can start moving on to environmental testing, which means we are getting very, very close to actually sending this off, which I'm very excited about. I don't know about you guys, but I do think there are alien fishies on this planet. I sure well, moon. So. I hope so, yes. Um, roughly, it's a great question. Not one I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, Jupiter itself is about, I believe, five times further from the sun than we are. So... If that helps, I don't remember the exact distance off the top of my head, um, but oh, Jupiter and its moons are about five times further from the sun than we are. It will also change depending on where we are in our orbit. So. But, but yeah. it is going to take the clipper, it is going to take it until about the year 2030 yeah. to get there. So it will be several years flying out there. I I don't remember actually. Let me pull it up. What was the question? When do we get access to the information from this clipper? Um, I know NASA is usually pretty good about putting things out um as soon as they've had a chance to look over it, which is usually um a few days to a few weeks. Yeah. So I'm sure right away we'll get the first images uh, with just, hey, we're successfully there. It's doing what it's supposed to do. And then as soon as they find things, um, it probably won't be long before they start having their first, you know, science press conference to let let us know what they found. Yes. All those lines are going to be mo moons orbiting around Jupiter. So Jupiter currently has about 95 moons. Mostly, most of them most likely captured asteroids from the asteroid belt. Which Jessica will so kindly fly out. How small is Europa? Uh, it's about the size of our moon. A little bit smaller, though. Just a little bit. Yes. We typically know what they're made of. There is another moon that's actually around Saturn that's very similar to Europa. It's called Enceladus. Enceladus is actually very interesting in itself. Uh, Enceladus has uh, uh, what we call cryovolcanism, which is essentially uh, ice volcanoes. It's pretty cool. Um, but uh, most of the moons around Jupiter have been discovered, and they are uh, most of them are going to be rocky debris left over from the creation of our solar system so a lot made up of like asteroids but there are other moons here honestly uh jessica do you want to pull up io real quick um before or as i'm working on that a couple of things um Braden, will you make sure your mic is pulled up close oh, yeah we're getting a little bit of sounds a little quiet sure can you hear me um, it looks like it's still coming through. Is it still, is the light still on? Yeah. Yeah, okay. It's pretty close now. Okay. Um, the, so our, our main plan for extra, like, I guess, terrestrial living would be Mars, but that's, that has troubles in its own right. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, Can yeah. Can you re please repeat the question so that the people online... Sure, yeah. When the end of the world is, uh, I don't have the, I don't have the exact date for that, believe it or not, but, uh, the, the, the most accurate thing, term I could probably put with that is going to be, it's probably when our sun, uh, explodes. 
which I don't remember. It's about five billion years. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Um, real quick, we do have a couple of questions coming in from online about Europa as well. Lovely. Um, and the Clipper. So first, uh, we've been asked, is the Clipper going to be sterilized? Um, and then second was about Europa. Um, do we know the origin of Europa? And I don't know if Brayden, you want to take either of those or do you want me to take? Um, well, for the origin, I can, for the origin of Europa, I, we, we know it. I believe it formed in place with Jupiter, which yes. uh, all of the Galilean moons did, I believe. Um, yeah, that's really that's really it for the origin, at least from my understanding of it. Yeah, and so I will Google the the sterilization. I as Jupiter was forming, it had its own little disk of debris around it um, that collected together and formed the four largest moons which we know of as the Galilean moons. Um, so it was almost like Jupiter and its moons were like a little mini solar system forming very similarly to how the solar system itself formed. Um, and then the rest of Jupiter's moons or most of the rest of them are captured asteroids. Um, so Europa and the other three Galilean and some of the medium sized ones as well, medium sized moons formed in place around Jupiter. Um, then as for the sterilization, probably we're not planning on landing it on mm -hmm. Europa. So there's not a risk of contaminating it. Uh, but when we do finally get to the stage that we will be landing on Europa, that absolutely has to be completely sterilized. Yeah. Um, um, I can, yes, question. How cold is Europa? Very cold. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I don't know exact temperatures. Neither do I. Um, but if we, if I turn us around a little bit um, and I can try, there it is. Do you see the sun way over there? Right okay. here? Yeah, um, that's the sun. <laughs> It's really far away, so you're not going to get nearly as much heat as we get here on the Earth. Um, so it's it's very cold, which is why the entire surface of Europa is frozen. Um, which leads into another question we did have online, um, asking where the water came from. Um, and there was water in the early solar system as the planets and moons formed. Um, moons like Io here were too hot when they were forming for that water to stay. It vaporized essentially and went away, um, you know, blew out into space. But Europa was cool enough while it was forming that the water stayed there. And that's why we see it. Good question. How come our water didn't vaporize? Ooh, that's because we got our water after the earth had already started cooling down some um our water is actually came from comets that hit the earth and then brought the water to us um to kind of continue about the moon discussion this is io um io is jessica is it your favorite galilean moon or is it is yours also Europa? No, Europa is my favorite, but I no, do okay. love Io. It's, well, it's my favorite Galilean. Moon, okay. So, do you want to take it then? Can I? Yeah, go ahead. All right. So Io, we like to very lovingly call Io the pizza moon because I mean, just kind of take a look at it. Um, this moon has a really interesting surface, and the reason that it has this sort of spotty, moldy pizza kind of looking surface to it is because Io is actually the most volcanically active object in our entire solar system. So what's happening here on Io is that there are hundreds and hundreds of volcanoes going through volcanic eruptions, which means the surface is constantly covered in this ever-changing surface of volcanic debris, pretty much. And so these dark spots are volcanoes, and um, the rest of it is, you know, just stuff that has been spewed out by these volcanoes. Now, it's really unusual for a moon to be very hot and very volcanic at this point in our solar system's history. 
because our solar system is old enough that at this point, small objects like this moon should have theoretically cooled off by now. But the reason that Io has so much heat still inside of its interior is because it's being tidally heated. So what this means is it's being pulled by the gravitational pull of Jupiter on one side and then all of Jupiter's other moons on the other side. So I want you to imagine you're outside on a very cold Minnesota day and your hands are cold and so you rub them together really fast. And what happens when you rub your hands together? They get warm, that's right. And the same thing is happening inside of Io, is all the rocks, as they're being very slightly, um, as the moon is being slightly stretched and squashed by this pull of gravity from both sides, these rocks are getting sort of rubbed together, which creates a lot of friction, which creates a lot of heat, and causes all of these volcanoes, because those that heat has to go somewhere. So that's why Io is as hot as it is. So it's a really interesting moon. And just to bring it back, that same process is happening on Europa. Yeah. I know Brayden mentioned this, yep. um, but that's why you have enough heat inside for it to be, for some of that ice to be melted into liquid water. Do you have a question? Never mind. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. How many galaxies are there? A lot. <laughs> More than seven. Um, there, there's a lot. There's a lot of galaxies. That actually is probably a pretty good transition into Jessica's topic. Um, let, let's we'll, hold Here. on to that question. We'll we'll go there <laughs> momentarily. Yes. So That's a really good question. I don't actually know the answer to that one, but Jessica, do you know about this? Yeah, so um, the question's about how the eruptions, sorry, just repeating for our folks online. Um, the question is about how the eruptions on, o on Io happen if they're like eruptions on Earth. Um, so one of the big differences is instead of being molten rock like we have on Earth, it's mostly, um, it's molten rock mixed in with a lot of molten sulfur which makes it um, highly, what's the word? Uh, explosive. Um, so the eruptions of these volcanoes is actually more like a geyser than what we would traditionally think of as a volcano. But you still get your molten um, stuff erupted out, flowing across the surface. Um, your volcanic plumes, it just, the mechanism is a bit more like a geyser if you want to compare it to something on Earth. Ooh, can you see the eruptions through telescopes? Not, no. not through telescopes that we have now. Um, we do have pictures, and I'm trying to see if I have any of them loaded, yes, I have one right here. Um, we do have pictures from spacecraft that have flown by, um, that have captured active eruptions. We also, and I don't have this one loaded in, um, we do have pictures of lava flows across the surface. Um, it's, it's really cool what all we've been able to see. And that's honestly, um, to tie in, we got asked about what's the most colorful moon um, of Jupiter, and I would definitely say Io is the most colorful, colorful, because we get all of these different yellows and oranges from the sulfur that's being deposited. All right. Yes. So the question was, is there a possibility that there's some kind of substance or like gem or mineral or stone on Io that we don't have on Earth? And that's a really good question. Um, I don't actually know the answer to that, but my best guess would be maybe. I mean, there's a lot of interesting processes going on. It just, 
like the formation of rock minerals is like highly dependent on the sort of like the situation going on where they're being formed. So you can get very different things forming if it's if the conditions are much hotter or cooler or you have different starting materials. So I don't know. Jessica, do you have anything to add about that? Yeah, uh, it's one of those we're not going to know until we're able to yeah. actually explore that. Um, a lot of these conditions we can mimic in a lab. Uh, and that's how we've learned about, you know, a lot of different states of matter and mineral formation and all of that. Um, but there's always the chance that there's something going on that we haven't thought about or that we can't uh, make in a lab. Um, so, yeah, we, we won't know for sure until we ever explore it more, which I'm not sure that there's any plans to because of how frequent eruptions and things are. It's not a safe place to be. No. Should we head on to our next topic? Do we want do do we want some slightly bad news? Yes. 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 Let's commit. Let's hear. Okay. It. All right. Um, well, for that, we're going to make our way over to Mars. Uh -oh. I know it's so sad. Um, so many of you may know that back in, oh, was it 2021? Um, we had a new rover that landed on Mars. It was the Perseverance rover. Um, and with it, it had the Ingenuity helicopter. Um, and Ingenuity, or its nickname is Jenny, uh, was our first test of flying somewhere other than Earth. Uh, Mars does have a thin atmosphere, so with a light enough craft, uh, there was the possibility that we could fly. Um, let me put up a model of Ingenuity. Um, and it successfully flew um, in April of 2021, becoming the first uh, craft to have a controlled flight on another world. Um, and to date, it has made 72 flights. Now, this thing we were hoping to get maybe five out of, uh, and we got 72. Uh, now, the sad news is on its last landing, um, Ingenuity damaged some of its rotors. And so it is no longer capable of flight. It is being retired. Um, it will, it is still, the electronics are still functioning, so it will continue to sit on Mars um, and take readings and things. Um, at least for as long as Perseverance is nearby to communicate with it, because we communicate with it through Perseverance. Um, but yes, our sweet, sweet little copter um, has reached the end of its flights on Mars and is being retired. And it makes me very sad, um, but it has done incredible things and we are very proud of it. I was going to say, it, it overwhelmingly exceeded its expectations. And Jenny can now rest yes. for a little while. And on the good news, it has shown that this can be done, um, which is great because we have plans for copters on other worlds. Um, in particular, we're working on Dragonfly. Uh, which is going to be a little quadcopter to fly around Saturn's moon Titan, which has a very thick atmosphere. Um, and that one is, we're so excited for it. But with the success of Jenny, we've shown that this, this can be done. Um, and so definitely looking forward to our next flight. And I know NASA is already looking at adding little copters to future missions that are already planned um, because we know it works. So why not take them along too? Question over here. 
perseverance? How long is perseverance going to keep like like surveying uh, Mars? As long as we're able to keep it going. I don't know. I don't remember the exact uh, length uh, length that we've predicted it'll last, though, Jessica. Do you remember? I don't, and part of that's also in the funding to have the crew back on Earth to keep running things. Um, but with a lot of these missions, you tend to get lots of extensions um, because they're doing so well. Um, and so you had things like, you might have heard of um, a Spirit and Opportunity, uh, which were two of the earlier rovers on Mars. Um, they initially were planned to run for, I think it was like 90 Martian days. And they ended up going for, what was it, like nine years? Yeah. Um, which is absurd. <laughs> um, but as long as it functions and we have the continued support, we're going to keep it going. All right. Well, I know we're getting to the end of our half hour. Um, I did want to end on a more positive note. Um, real quick from our chat online, uh, we've been asked about the India landing on Earth's moon, and I will admit mm -hmm. I don't know that much about it. Do any of you know much about that? I unfortunately don't know much either. Okay. Um, yeah. So I what know. I will probably do um, is I will go and find some information and we'll post it uh, later. Um, but I will, I will definitely look into that uh, because... That's one thing that I've been meaning to look more into and keep up to date with. And it's just, there's a lot of things to keep up to date with in astronomy. Yep. Um, there's, there's just a lot going on, but all right. So question right here. What was that? You said love. Yep. I was getting to uh, that. Uh, yep. I was just about to get there. So we got asked about, um, how many galaxies there are. So first thing I'm going to do is we are going to fly ourselves. Come on. Uh, we are going to fly ourselves out of our solar system to our galaxy, which we can see here. And then we're going to keep going. We live in a universe full of galaxies. And this is all real data. This is real galaxies, uh, where they actually are, what they look like. Uh, but this is just the closest and brightest. So if we want to see all of the galaxies, I'm going to need to add in more. But instead of pretty pictures, we have just colorful dots to indicate where the galaxies are. But we have to keep adding more and more and more and more. We got one more. There we go. Yeah. So you may notice that there that it looks kind of like a butterfly and we've got some stuff missing at the top and bottom. Um, that's not actually empty space. It's just to look in those two directions. We have to look through our galaxy, which blocks our view. So we think that these, what look like empty regions, should actually be filled just like everywhere else is. And so we estimate that there are about 2 trillion galaxies in our observable universe. But that is changing. That number is going up because we have the wonderful James Webb Space Telescope that is able to see galaxies that are even further away um, and even dimmer than we've been able to see so far. Um, and with that, I want to lead into the very last thing I want to show you.
Um, just, I think it was two days ago, James Webb released uh, 19 new images of galaxies um, that it has imaged. And so let me bring these up. And <laughs> do you want to see some of these? All right, so what we're going to see first is a picture of a galaxy from the Hubble Space Telescope. So this is Hubble's view. And then it's going to switch to the James Webb <laughs> view. Now, James Webb looks at a different type of light than Hubble does. Hubble looks at visible light, the light we see with our eyes. Um, James Webb looks at infrared light. So if I fade James Webb down, if you look at the... Hubble image again, wherever you see these dark streaks, those are dense, cool clouds of gas and dust, which shine bright in infrared. So all of the things that were dim and hard to see in visible light with Hubble, James Webb is able to pick up on those. And this is important because it's in these gas clouds where new stars are being formed. And so you're seeing new star formation. Uh, let me pull up another one. So again, start with the Hubble and then we'll transition to the James Webb. It does, yeah, it does kind of look like fire with the colors. Um, because this is infrared, which is a color that our eyes don't see, we get to paint the colors or we get to paint the pictures whatever color we want. And we tend to pick reds since infrared sits just below red. So the closest color that we can see to it is reds. Um, and so we tend to associate those. Uh, we tend to use that color scheme. Uh, but what I really like and let me pull up another one, is in some of these, this is gonna be a good one, um, you can even see individual little red clumps. Mm. Those are newly forming stars. Those little bright red clumps that you're seeing are newly forming stars. Um, now, while these galaxies aren't that far away, um, they're relatively nearby. They're all, I believe, less than 100 million light years from us. Um, <laughs> I know, not that far away, you know, 30, 40 million light years away. Um, that's still relatively close in the scheme of things. Um, we are using, or James Webb is helping us to study star formation and understand how galaxies form and evolve, which is going to help us understand how our universe went from the early stages to what we see today. So having these galaxies today in detail to compare to the very, very, very young galaxies that James Webb will also see um, helps give us different, you know, points on our evolution so that we can try and figure out how do you get from A to B? How do you get from that to what we see here now? Um, and I'll just go ahead and put up a few more um, real quick, just because they're gorgeous. And I figure no one has a problem with spending another couple minutes looking at these gorgeous pictures. So we got a question of, are there planets in these, in these galaxies? Most likely. Probably. Yeah. Most likely. In our galaxy, the Milky Way, there are about 200 billion stars. Um, and it is estimated that about 100 billion of those have planets orbiting around a bit. It's also estimated that about 20 billion of those are um, planets that are in the habitable zone that are Earth-like. So we, there's a, there's a, I'll just leave it at that. There's a really, really good chance that these have planets. And from what we can tell, planet formation is a natural part of star formation, right? Stars form, planets form around them. So 
yeah, there's there's probably lots and lots of baby planets around these baby stars that are forming in these galaxies. All right, well, we've gone a little bit over time. Um, I guess we can take maybe one more question if there's any others. Question over here? Star Wars. <laughs> question was Star Trek or Star Wars? Star Wars. I don't know. I got to say Star Trek. I'm sorry. <laughs> but would you Star Trek. answer this question? Star Trek. Jessica, movie. how about you? Star Trek or Star Wars? <clears throat> Firefly. Okay. <laughs> Contrarian, but okay. Well, with that then, I will bring our lights up. If you do have any other questions, feel free to just come up and ask us. Um, before you leave tonight, there are some uh, star charts out on the table in front of the TV at the main entrance. Feel free to grab one of those. Um, thank you so much for coming out. I hope you enjoyed this. If this is a format that you like, please let us know. Um, we've done this once before. Um, it's something we're kind of experimenting with now that we're back live for our Wednesday show. So if you liked this, if you'd like us to do more, please let us know. Um, Cause obviously we want to do stuff that you want to come and see and spend an evening with us. Um, all right. Yeah. Again, thanks again. Uh, have a safe trip home and we'll hopefully see you again next time. Thank you. Thank you.